My name's Joel. It's lovely to um, be able to stand up here and speak to you this morning. We're in this series in 1 Samuel. Um, as an aside, I don't know if any of you got hay fever, but I've just made the mistake of just itching my eye once before I stood up here, having not itched it at all this morning. And so I'm really hoping that I won't spend the next 20 minutes just uh, scratching my eyes and getting distracted. I should, uh, teach me for not, not spraying the stuff up my nose this morning. Anyway. We're in this series in 1 Samuel, and we're looking at these, these themes that come through it. They come throughout the whole Bible, really, but the themes that we're picking up in this story of 1 Samuel that ask the question, who is in charge? So they're asking us, who, who do we pin our hopes on? What is it we put our confidence in, our hope in? Where do we, where do we put, our, put our faith what do we look to to fulfill our, our hopes and our dreams, our desires? Because whether you're part of the church or not, we, we put our hope in something. We've, already, we've sung this morning, we've sung that uh, you're the Almighty, that last song, or the, the, the penultimate song that we've sung. That you're the King of Kings, every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, that's, and so for some of us, maybe we, we, say, we say that Jesus is in charge, but more often than not, we make mistakes, don't we? And we, we kind of start to look elsewhere, and we might look to, to money, or we might look to our job, or our children, or we look to ourselves, and we look to all these other things that aren't God, to say, actually, maybe, maybe, maybe this is where I'm going to find my confidence. Maybe this is where I'm going to find it. And, and that's what we see with these people in 1 Samuel. They look to all of these different things. They, they think, actually, I can't put my trust in God, so I'm going, to, I'm going to put it in myself, I'm going to put it in, in these other things, or looking more like those kind of people, because they look, like they're, they look like they're happy, they look like they've got their lives together, but these things, they're not, they're not reliable, they don't, they don't satisfy, they don't bring ultimate uh, fulfillment and enjoyment, and this morning we have a choice, we can, we can choose to say, God, I, I recognise that you are the Lord of my life, and I want to follow you, or we can say, actually, I want to, do, I want to go my own way, I want to do my own thing. I want, to, I want to be in charge of my life, and I'll see how it goes. It might work out, it might not, but I, I want to do my own thing. And that's our choice this morning, and that's the choice that we see with the two characters and where we're at in the story. We're in 1 Samuel 13. So if you've got a Bible, fantastic. You can flick through to 1 Samuel. It's right near the front of your Bible. If you haven't, don't worry. Stuff will come up on the screen. But we see these two characters of, of Jonathan and King Saul. So we've got King Saul. Rod spoke about them last week. King Saul and his son, Jonathan are the two characters we're looking at. And maybe you'll relate to one more than the other. If you've been following along with our, our reading plan that we've been going through, 1 Samuel on Instagram or on Facebook, um, maybe you'll think, actually, I'm more like Saul than I would like to be, if you know the story. I'm more like this guy who, keep, who makes mistakes, who messes up, despite his, it talks about him being tall and a good warrior and all these good attributes he might have. We off, will too often find us we think, actually, maybe I'm a bit more like him. I, I want to be like these other guys. It sounds like they're the, they're the goodies. They're the ones who are doing the right thing. But more often, we, I think we think, actually, I'm a, bit more like, I'm a bit more like Saul. So I wonder today, as we, as we read this story, who you identify more with. And maybe there's things for you to be encouraged by and think, oh, yeah, that's, I can see that in me. Or you think, oh, I, I see that in me. That's, that's worrying. Or, you know, you have to be encouraged or challenged or things to learn from, just stuff for us to think about for good or for bad. And if the story's new for you, then I'll just recap it. Um, I'll just recap it for us just to help us set the scene for where we're at. And so God's people, the Israelites, they've been rescued out of slavery in Egypt. They've entered into this promised land, having walked around for an awfully long time in the wilderness. Uh, and they've made it into this land that God has promised them. Yet things aren't going well. They've rebelled against God. It says at the end of the book of Judges, they are doing, they are doing what is right in their own eyes. They're not looking to God for guidance, but they're looking to themselves, and it's not going well for them. And what they've done is they've demanded a king, just like the other nations around them. They, don't want to, they were called to be distinct, yet they said, we want, to look, we want a king like the other nations who will go for us, who will fight our battles. When they already had a king, they had, they had God, the one who had saved them and who had delivered them, yet they say they want a king like the other nations. They were called to model something different to what it truly look like to be human to the rest of the world. Yet here they are just doing exactly what the rest of the world is doing and ignoring what God has called them to. And so where we're at in 1 Samuel, we find this king called Saul hiding in, uh, it says they're hiding in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. 
That's what it says. And it says uh, it's, so, it's got so bad that some of them, they've crossed back over. They've crossed into, uh, into the land that God had promised them in, over the River Jordan. Some of them, it's got so bad that they've crossed back over and they've joined their enemy camp. They've gone and joined the Philistines. And it says of the Philistines in this passage here that they were like the sand on the seashore in multitude. And if you know the beginning of this story, you know that all these, these few books ago that you find at the start in Genesis, that God had promised to Abraham that his children would be like the sand on the seashore. And yet we read in this part of the story that it's not, it's not God's people fulfilling their promises or entering into what God has given them. It's actually the, the enemies of God's people. It's the Philistines who are as like the sand on the seashore and it's God's people who are hiding in tombs. Imagine that, hiding being so fearful and uh, lacking faith in God that they're, they're hiding in all these different places while the enemy are standing mocking them. And so the theme that we're looking at today, and we'll see it good and bad, is faith. The theme of faith. That's what we're looking at um, that we'll see in this part of the story. And the Bible defines faith in Hebrews 11 as the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. That's what it talks about. I don't know what faith means to you, but that's how the Bible um, defines it. Right? It's having, being persuaded of something, having a confidence in something that can't necessarily be seen. And in this, this passage in Hebrews, it goes on to talk about person after person after person who's achieved incredible things by faith. They talked about all these characters throughout the, throughout the Old Testament who have, who have done these incredible deeds uh, through their faith in God. And it comes from a confidence that goes beyond their immediate circumstances. It talks about, in this chapter in Hebrews, it says um, you, they knew they could go through all this, all this persecution that's happening there, their properties being taken away from them, they're finding themselves in jail, and yet the writer of Hebrews says, you could do all of this and have compassion since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Right? They knew that their, their, faith, that their faith told them that actually there's something more than what we see in our current reality, that what we see right here and right now that gives us an assurance that means we don't have to have the same the fear and worry. We, when we look around the world at the at wars and at economic crisis uh, and COVID and all these different things, it means that we can have an, an assurance because actually it's not just all about the, the right here and right now. We can have a faith. And this is what this story tells us. So I'm going to read from uh, chapter 14, verse 1. It says, one day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. Right? So they've all been, they're all hiding. The Philistines are on the other side of this valley. And Jonathan says, come, let's go over to the other side. But he did not tell his father. And I'm going to skip down just to the end of chapter 3. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of one was Bozes and the name of the other, Senna. And one crag rose on the north in front of Mishmash and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. We're not going to pick up on that verse today, but I, just lo- I love that verse. Don't we need people like that? That are, gonna, that are for us, that are going to get alongside us and say, Do all that is in your heart. I am with you, heart and soul. I love that verse. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand. And this shall be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have been hiding themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan, his armor-bearer, and said, Come up to us, 
and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to us, like a, you know, it's a bit of a lame taunt there, it's a, it's a taunt. <laughs> come up to us and we'll show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has given them into our hand, or into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made killed about 20 men within as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. See, either side of this story, either side of this story, read about Saul who's like a, it's kind of the opposite. So it's it's this contrast, the bookend, this this particular account of Jonathan, we see Saul doing, showing instead of a a faith like Jonathan, we see a a lack of faith. Before this happens with the Philistines encamped around, we see uh, Saul, he makes a sacrifice that he wasn't supposed to make. He was meant to wait for Samuel, he didn't wait for Samuel, and he sacrifices to God because he's so worried about what the Philistines um, are going to do because there's so many of them. And after this story, we see Saul, he doesn't rush straight into this battle, even though the enemy have been put into a, a panic in their camp. But he, and he makes this vow, and he says, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. Right, he does these things, he, his, his, his faith isn't in, his trust isn't in God, it's not in that God is in charge, but it's, you read it in the phrase he says there, until I am avenged on my enemies. It's not become about God anymore, it's become about him and, and his, him being avenged, and he's lost perspective of who is in charge. And so we see this comparison of, of Jonathan and of Saul in these stories. Now we can have that, that'd be great. I just, you know, don't, people get distracted very easily. And so Saul here, he's painted as a, as kind of a fool, Samuel says to him, when, Saul, when uh, Samuel arrives, just before the bit we've read, you can read it another time, he says, what you have done foolishly here. You have done foolishly. Whereas, whereas Jonathan, he's pictured as a, as a saviour. That's what the people call him. He's, Jonathan has brought salvation to us with the victory that he has claimed. And so there we see this contrast between these two, these two characters. So Saul, he, he was faithless, he trusted in the numbers. He was looking at the Philistines and saying, well, they are, they are many, how are we going to do we, Let's hide, we need to hide. What, what are we going to do against such numbers? Whereas we see Jonathan, who says, it may be that the Lord will work for us. The Lord can save by many or by few. And it's easy for us, isn't it? It's easy for us to, to look to numbers and find our security in numbers, we can look to our bank balance and think, okay, well, stuff's going, stuff's going badly around me, but I can look. Well, not me personally, my bank balance, but some of you can look at your bank balance. And you can say, well, look, I've got... My, I mean, I'm not, I'm not you know, just so you know. Let's go and get my credit deals up. I'm not in massive debt, but, you know, I'm not looking at it and thinking, wow, look at those lovely six-figure numbers there. Uh, but some of us, we can look at numbers and we can think, oh, okay, well, if everything else goes belly up, I've got, my, I've got money to fall back on. Right, that's going to that's gonna rescue me. Or even as a, as a church, we can think, well, what can we do as a church of 130 people? We're in a town of 100-odd thousand people. Like, what, what, what impact can we have? Or some of you might even think, and I'm embarrassed to say that sometimes I do, I have thought this in the past, and I challenge myself, I have to remind myself. But you can think, well, if there's not at least 120 people here on a Sunday, then is it worth coming? You know, is God gonna is God gonna do anything good on a Sunday if there's not a, you know at least half the room full? If I stand up here and I see half empty chairs, I think, oh, is it worth was it worth getting all those chairs out? Was it was it worth you know turning up here and doing all the teas and coffees? I'm not saying I do. I don't I don't think that. But it's a danger, isn't it, to think we look at numbers and we can associate strength with numbers. When actually, it's the, Jonathan here is just him and his armor bearer, and he goes up to this garrison. He's far outnumbered. God can save by many or by few. So it's not about the money in your bank account. It's not about the number of people sitting here, although we'd love that to be more. We want to see people come to know Jesus. We want to see more and more people sitting in these seats. It's not about the number of likes we get on social media. God can save by many or by few. And then we see... Um, Saul, 
He, he trusts in numbers, but he also makes excuses. So when, when Samuel turns up in this passage in, in chapter 13, um, Saul, he's just like us, isn't he? It's, easy, it's so easy to make excuses. I don't know if you can... You probably don't even remember the last time you made an excuse because it's just so easy for us to do. It's just so common. You just do it, kind of just naturally rolls off the tongue. And Saul, what he says when Samuel turns up and says, what have you done? Why have you made this sacrifice? Saul blames the people. He says, well, they were, they were scattering for me. They were leaving. I had to, I had to do something. And he, or he, he blames Samuel. He says, well, you hadn't turned up. You said, wait seven days. I'd wait six and a half days. I was close enough, and you still hadn't turned up. And then he's, Samuel's still not, he's still not taking, he's still not appreciating the predicament that Saul was in. And so Saul says, well, and then I've got these Philistines. They're about to attack. I was forced to act. I was compelled to do it because... Because, you went, because the people were leaving, you weren't here, and look at these Philistines. Well, I should remind you of a, a story right at the beginning of this book in Genesis where, where Adam and Eve, they take, a, they take a bite of this apple, and God comes to, to Adam and says, what have you done? And he said, well, this woman, she made me do it. <laughs> and God, where, where were you? Well, it's just ingrained in us to, to make excuses. And I do it far more often. I've got, I had some examples, but I just can't. They're too embarrassing to get. And there's just too many. It's like, which one do I choose? <laughs> but we, we do it more often than we'd like. And we, have to watch, we just have to, to watch ourselves. Whereas, whereas Jonathan, he didn't make excuses. He says it may be that the Lord will work for us. He actually, there was no tax. He strategically, militarily, everything he did was, was wrong. Well, he gave up, they gave up their position. He let the, the Philistine garrison know where he was. Uh, he, was in a, he, was on, he was up high, you know, in a stronger position. He, went, he came down low, and then he climbs up the other side of this cliff face. Like, it says hands and feet. He's not like he's got a shield above his head or he's protecting himself. And they can launch anything down at him. And then he turns up just two against this garrison of 20 or more. Right, rather than give excuses, he goes in faith and says, it may be that the Lord will work for us. Not that he definitely will, but he knows that he knows God is good, and so he says, it may be that God will work for us. And so we see this, this faithless Saul contrasted with this faithful Jonathan. And too often, like I said at the start, we, we find ourselves like Saul, because it's easy to find us to struggle with unbelief. Like if you're, a, if you're a part of the church, it's easy to struggle with unbelief because the, the devil loves us to question, does, does God really care about me? Does he really love me? Did he really say, did he really say that? Did he, did he really want that for you? Because if he wanted that for you, then how, why did he let this happen? Or why did, that per, why did this happen to that person? And we can, we can end up questioning ourselves or questioning God. And some of us right now are going through really hard times. Some of us have been through really hard times. And it's why it's important for us to know as a church, as individuals, that God is good. To know the truth of who, to know the truth of who God is. So when those difficult times come, we, we, can, we don't find ourselves like Saul, but we find ourselves like Jonathan, standing on solid ground, confident, full of faith about who God is and what he has done. Because too often we believe the lie that our culture tells us. That why, why bother trying? Why bother looking out there to the 100,000 people who don't know me? Why bother talking to my neighbor? Why bother doing this, that, or the other? Because does God really want to use you? Does God really want to use you? Does he want to use you to do those things? And we know the answer, don't we? Yeah. Do you know the answer? Yeah. God does want to use us, doesn't he? Yeah. He wants to use us. He wants to use you individually. He wants to use us corporately as a church family together to bring glory to him, to bring his kingdom uh, to, the, to, the, to the places outside this building as we go out from here, to, to our neighbors, to our workplaces, to our families, to the nations. He wants to bring uh, his kingdom everywhere we go. And so we see Jonathan pictured as this savior, the hero. And how is he so full of faith? He's full of faith of because he knows who God is. He's, he knows the stories. He's been reminded of the stories of what God has done and, and how he has worked for his people in rescuing them out of uh, slavery in Egypt and bringing them through uh, the wilderness and providing for them there and bringing them into the promised land. He knows, he knows who God is, and so he can have faith that God wants to work in his future. He wants God is for them. He wants to bless them. 
And so we can say, let's go and do this. Maybe God will give us the victory. It didn't make tactical sense. It was easy. It was easy for him to reason his way out of things. But he knew that God was for him. Jonathan knows that God is in charge. And so he looks at what God has done and how he's worked for his people. And for us, I wonder what it is for you. So Jonathan, he sees what God has put, it, what God has put in front of him and he just takes a step, doesn't he? He just takes that one simple step of faith and he takes another step and another step and another step. I wonder what it is for you that God has put in your hand. What has he put in front of you? What has he put for you to step into this morning or in this week? Maybe it's an opportunity at work. Maybe it's a, a relationship that you've got with, uh, with someone or a friendship, someone you meet every day but you don't really know. Maybe it's, it's something in the, in the church. Maybe it's with the food bank and how you can serve there or with tots or something else. Maybe it's with a particular people group in our town or in the nations or maybe it's a, it's a family. Who, you know, it's different for all of us, isn't it? But what has God put in front of you? What has he put in your hand? It's easy to make excuses. It's easy to say, well, when, I, when I've got everything together, when I, know, when I know this, that, and the other, when I can really, clean, really clearly see God work here, here, and here, then maybe I'll start doing stuff. That's not what Jonathan does. He doesn't say, well, I've got this big tick list, and God's done everything on it, and I've, got, I've heard the audible voice of God in every single one of those situations, and now I'm going to do it. He says, maybe he will work for us. And so we get to be filled with faith this morning. Just as Jonathan was filled with faith because he knew who God was, he knew his character, he knew what he'd done in the past, we get to be filled with faith because of the stories we read in here. We get to be filled with faith because of, because of stories, because of testimonies that we hear amongst us. Wasn't it? it was great hearing Becky the other week share about how she had been uh, prayed for and healed a couple of weeks ago. And we get to that should fill us with faith to think, actually, God, God is not just someone who was at work thousands of years ago in this book, but he is at work here and now. But we also get to look back and be reminded of the, the ultimate sacrifice. We get to look back at the turning point in history when Jesus was crucified on the cross. For you and me, when he gave himself up, that's how we can have faith, because God didn't even hold back his own son but he gave his son for us. Romans 8, 31, 32 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He didn't spare his own son, but gave himself up for us. Maybe you came here this morning and you were wondering if God loves you, or does he care about you, or does he even know, does he even know your name? Well, we, get to, we get to look at the cross and we see how much Jesus loves us. We get to see how good he is, how merciful and gracious he is, how humble he is that the king of the universe would allow himself to be nailed to a wooden cross to take our sin and our shame and he gives us victory. Right? We were outcasts, but we get invited to come and sit at the family table. So really, I, I want to encourage us. I think we came up briefly in the, in the worship. I want to encourage us to lift our eyes this morning and focus not on, uh, not on what is going on around us, but to focus on the one who is in charge, the one who gave himself for us, who loves us. It's so easy to be distracted and downhearted by things that are happening, easy to focus on the world events and sucked into this fatalistic way of seeing things. Well, what's the point? The world's going to hell in a handbasket, whatever the phrase is. What's the point? I may as well give up. But the church family, God has called us to something here. He has called us to something. He's called us. We have a purpose in this place. We have a purpose in this town, something bigger than our, that, something bigger than our own comfort, something bigger than my, my own comfort and your own comfort. So he's called us to this town and the towns and cities beyond and to the nations. So let's not, let's not be the ones that are hiding in caves. Let's not be the ones that are hiding in cisterns and in tombs and in holes in the rocks, looking after our own interests and just trying to survive. But let's, let's lift our eyes to see what God is doing and be full of faith for it. Let's not be scared to engage the world, but trust God, because we know that he is in charge. Ben, do you want, do you want to come up? And really, I, just, 
I would love us to leave this morning with more faith. It's not a faith that I can, I can give you. It's a faith that, that God can give you, that he has plans and purposes for us. That he wants, to, he wants to use us. He wants just the things that he has put in, at your hand, the things he has put in front of you, he wants to use to bring glory to his name and for, to, to bring people who are far away close to him. And so I can I invite you to stand and we're going to pray. If you want more faith this morning, can I just encourage you as I pray, just to put your hat, you can put your hands out, just some kind of posture of openness. Say, God, give me faith for this thing that I'm struggling with. God, I want to give me a, a, a peace and assurance in my heart. God, I thank you that you go ahead of us, that we... We have the victory, not because of what we've done, but because of what you have done, because of who you are. We want to hold on to you, Jesus. We want to keep our eyes fixed on you. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God, thank you that you are faithful even when we are faithless, even when we are far more like Saul than we are like Jonathan, thank you that you are still faithful, that we can trust in you. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is a habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing nearer. God, I pray that we be full of faith for what you've called us to here. Full of faith for, for our town and for the regions beyond. And God, I pray, help us to stir one another up to love and good works. We love you, Lord, and we put our trust in you this morning. Amen.